This is a production of Cornell University. The Center for the Study of Economy and Society's Lecture Series. I'm Victor Nee, a uh, faculty in the Department of Sociology. And this is an ongoing lecture series which uh, provides the forum for sociologists, economic sociologists, and social scientists to present their uh, results of their research and findings to a cross-disciplinary audience. Um, Jack Goldstone uh, earned his PhD at Harvard. I followed his career with great interest ever since that time when he came out. Uh, and this has been a truly distinguished career. He is the Virginia and John Hazel Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University and a non-resident senior fellow of the Brookings Institute. He's also a lifelong member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, previously, uh, Jack was taught at Northwestern University and the University of California at Davis um, and other campuses, I think. He is the author of the award-winning Revolution and Rebellion in the Early Modern World, also Why Europe, the Rise of the West in World History, and his latest book, Political Demography, How Population Changes Are Reshaping International Security and National Politics. Policies has become an important um, platform for much of the debate on just this issue of population growth. Um, Jack Goldstone has uh, clearly established a distinguished scholarly career. Uh, he's published, I think, a dozen books, uh, important books, and many, many articles that have been uh, appeared in the top journals of sociology and also political science. But he's also one of the very few sociologists who have made it big as a public intellectual. Um, and he has uh, appeared on NPR, CNN, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, Fox News, and he's written for uh, Foreign Policy Atlantic, the Washington Post, and other um, news media. So he has uh, also worked extensively with the uh, U.S. intelligence community uh, in forecasting global conflict and terrorism. Um, and with the international, U.S. Agency of International Development and the World Bank on providing uh, advice on democracy. This recent essay in Foreign Affairs, uh, The New Population Bond, now has uh, created quite a stir and there's good, considerable di discussion about whether uh, there is indeed a new uh, demographic crisis on the horizon. But he, today he's going to talk about uh, a, a theme that was part of an earlier work, but which he's updated, The Rise of the West in the Global Context, Culture and Change, 1500 to 1850. Thank you. Thank you. Back at Cornell, it's been too long, so thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate the chance to address this audience and to be part of this very distinguished series. Now, uh, when I was in graduate school, we thought that we were kind of in a golden age of historical sociology. Uh, people like Shmuel Eisenstadt and uh, Emanuel Wallerstein, Theta Scotchpole, uh, were writing big books. And it, it's interesting that just now in the past few years, we seem to have entered another era of big books, uh, these focusing on the problem of the rise of the West. So we've had big books by uh, Neil Ferguson, Civilization, uh, Jim Robinson and Darren Asimoglu. You had Professor Robinson here earlier in the series writing on why states fail. Uh, we also have uh, books by Frank uh, Fukuyama, my uh, former colleague at George Mason, now at Stanford, uh, on the, um, the rise of states. Um, Ian Morris, a historian from Stanford, uh, also wrote uh, on why the West rules. So we have really just a, a remarkable outpouring of research uh, claiming to explain what this period, this very, I think, critically significant period in world history, when we start to see a great divergence, uh, economically, technologically, politically, between the West 
and the rest of the world. Uh, now, the presentation I'm giving today is just one chapter in what is a larger work that also addresses issues of political change, uh, changes in network structure, the role of entrepreneurship. So this is a piece a little bit out of context, uh, but it focuses on something that I think is quite often neglected, and that is the role of culture and cultural change uh, in opening the pathways for innovation. A lot of people argue that innovation is the key to economic growth. There's not much argument on that, yet no one really has a clue where innovation comes from. Uh, and I'm at least going to point out today that I think there's some important cultural foundations for the key innovations uh, that produce the rise of the West. So let's see where we go. Um, there are so many theories that have been developed over time uh, for the rise of the West. I group them into five clusters, uh, the five A's, um, somewhat artificially. Uh, but this is a very big problem. We've been working on this problem since the days of uh, Marx and Weber. Everybody has their favorite explanation. But in, in some sense, the fact that so many distinguished scholars have worked on this problem and have been unable to agree on an answer, uh, it's both humbling, suggests that the problem is massive, uh, and convinces me that I'm unlikely to persuade you that I have the answer either. Uh, but I do think I can advance the conversation a little bit. So one approach is simply to look at accumulation. And this view has uh, changed over time, because uh, from the day of Marx, people worried about the primitive accumulation, uh, that is, the accumulation of territory or the accumulation of capital. Uh, but there have been more sophisticated versions of this lately. Robert Allen has argued uh, that it is the ratio in the cost of labor and the cost of capital, capital becoming cheaper over time in Northern Europe, uh, labor in England in particular becoming expensive, and that drove people to invest in uh, labor-saving machinery. Uh, Aded Galore argues that you reach a certain critical point in the accumulation of technical change where people start to recognize that investing in technical change rather than just waiting for it to come along will pay dividends. And at that point, he argues, you see a sudden big shift and the rate of technological change grows. Uh, Robert Lucas, uh, Joel Mokir, Paul Romer have all argued that it's, it's not quite right to focus on the accumulation of capital, physical capital, financial capital. Uh, they've said we need to focus on the accumulation of knowledge. Uh, and there's a whole school of work on what they call useful and reliable knowledge as the key to growth. Well, that's fine for me. However, um, whether you're talking about the accumulation of capital or the accumulation of technolog te technological change or the accumulation of knowledge, uh, you're all basically saying Factor X is what drove the rise of the West. And as X grew, whatever X is, it le led to economies of scale and accelerating growth. Um, Ian Morris even goes in this direction. His argument of why the West rose is the West was the first civilization to master the use of fossil fuel technology. Uh, but that begs the question of why that happened, given that fossil fuels had actually been around for a very long time. Um, the more recent arguments of Asimoglu Robinson and Douglas North and colleagues is that what matters is institutions, uh, in particular, open access institutions. Uh, they argue that the world is full of two different kinds of states. Almost all of the states that were pre-modern were closed access. That is, they were structured to benefit a closed elite. And it was only with the opening of access, uh, restructuring societies in such a way that uh, there were lower costs of entry, lower costs of political participation. You move toward democracy. You move toward open access orders. Uh, then you get a flowering of entrepreneurship and hence economic growth. Uh, Asimoglu and Robinson put it in terms of predatory versus inclusive. But the bottom line is still there are good states. There are bad states. Most of history, unfortunately, has been people being ruled by bad states. And it was only in the 17th and 18th century that we start to see the emergence of states with limited power and accountability. And it was the kind of um, credible commitment to restrain the state that led in various ways to economic growth. I will get back to what I see as the problems with all of these. Let me just get them out there. Um, a longstanding approach is to look at culture and claim that the culture in the West was somehow more dynamic, more innovative. Um, Doug North did some of this earlier on, but certainly um, Lynn White 
Uh, Max Weber, Protestant ethic argument, falls into this category. Uh, Polanyi, uh, David Landis, uh, and Deidre McCloskey's work on the bourgeois virtues puts another angle on this, that the West came to appreciate certain bourgeois values at a time that was, uh, they were not appreciated elsewhere. Uh, in any event, the whole idea is that people changed what they were doing, what was their habit. Some people have stressed a culture of acquisition. Other people have stressed a culture of consumption. I think these two are contradictory, but people talk about a consumer revolution in the 17th century as leading to a change in behavior and attitudes that made people want to uh, work harder to innovate and accumulate things. Uh, other people talk about the desire to uh, be frugal and rational and thrifty, the Ben Franklin approach. Uh, but you know, these are two sides of the same coin. They both argue for a change. Um, an older approach that I don't think is as popular anymore but is still worth keeping in mind is the argument about imperialism and colonialism. That is, the West aggrandized itself at the expense of peripheral and semi-peripheral regions. Uh, and it was that, you know, whether it's Marx or Wallerstein or Eric Williams, uh, the argument is sometimes still made that we are um, looking at a world of post-colonialism in which the colonial societies uh, were disadvantaged by having suffered at the hands of imperialism. Uh, finally, there's an argument from demography. The old version is that abstinence mattered. That is, European societies, it was said, had lower fertility, better control of child rearing, and therefore uh, did not burden the environment, burden their resources to the same degree that China and India did, where it was argued that fertility was uh, checked. Well, we now know that, in fact, even though it is true that Asian societies had much earlier rate of marriage, and you would have expected that perhaps to lead to larger families and faster population growth, Asian societies had other mechanisms for reducing fertility within marriage rules about spacing of children, uh, sending young men to work in distant cities after they were married, rules against widow remarriage that took fertility out of the system at the older ages rather than the younger ones. Anyway, we now know that rates of population growth and fertility were not that different. There's been a new demographic theory, though, by Greg Clark at UC Davis, which got a lot of attention. Uh, Clark argued that the reason the West grew richer is that there was a large differential in survival between uh, richer, more economically successful families and those who were not. And he argued that over time, the selective higher survival of the more economically successful groups gave an advantage to those groups. Now, in fact, there wasn't, I don't think that was that distinctive in Europe, in fact, uh, in China also we see greater survival rates among those who are economically better off. He argues though that to be economically better off in Asia, uh, you accumulated land and political power to become economically better off in uh, Europe. Uh, a lot of families had to do well in business. So he felt that success in business was uh, rewarded in Darwinian fashion. Now there are a lot of holes that people have poked in this argument, among others the fact that business people were concentrated in the cities, and cities had such high rates of mortality that the urban population was constantly being replenished with migrants from the countryside, and therefore whatever line survived was eventually diluted through marriage. So I don't think it's such a good argument. But the, the very fact that Clark had to stretch that far to say, my God, we can't find any other explanation that's credible. Maybe it was the reproduction of entrepreneurial talent over time just shows how far people have had to go to try and explain why the West. Now, for a long time, um, people took it for granted that the differences between Europe and Asia were very large uh, throughout most of history. And it, it was kind of a question of, well, which of these differences is responsible for the success of the West? But what we've seen in world history in the last few decades is an appreciation for the variety, the sophistication, the technical skill, the degree of trade that was conducted in Asia. And the, the California School of World Historians, of which I consider myself part, has argued that to a very large degree, in terms of economic and political institutions, we don't see big differences between major Asian civilizations and the leading Western civilizations until relatively late, not until the end of the 18th century or the early 19th century. And that puts a new, new spin on things. Uh, 
So let me get back to the way that uh, develops. But the, the real problem we have to explain now is not just why did the West beat the rest, but given that the East and West seem to be on similar and parallel tracks for century after century, up to the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, why was there this kind of sudden jump? And I'll show you how sudden it is from the data. Um, there are two main approaches, I would argue, to this problem of the rise of the West and this great divergence. The economic approach, as you might imagine, uh, stresses incremental continuous change. As I mentioned, the accumulation functions, the accumulation of capital, the accumulation of useful knowledge, the accumulation of technology. Uh, Robert Lucas puts it in terms of the accumulation of human capital, that is education and skills spreading through the population. But the idea in most of the economic approaches is that there was a gradual accumulation of advantage in the West over time, and when it reached a critical level, you see a sudden takeoff. The um, model goes that you know, classical Greece had certain uh, breakthrough ideas. Uh, the Renaissance recovered them. 1688, we see some institutional changes, uh, the rise of corporations, uh, the Bank of England as a source of credit, uh, Parliament putting restrictions on the king. Uh, we see then proto-industrialization start to take off in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, merchant capitalism with the global expansion of European trade. And finally, ta-da, all of this accumulated advantage leads to industrial capitalism. That is, we start to see uh, widespread factory, machine manufacture, uh, high technology, and European production overwhelms that around the world. The um, approach in sociology is different. Sociologists have tended to look at the transition from traditional to modern society as a discontinuous quantum leap. We speak of the transition from feudalism to capitalism, where feudalism is a complex social whole. It's a set of political and economic relationships involving hierarchy, uh, legal reciprocal obligations, certain patterns of military and land organization. In other words, it's kind of a holistic view. There's this feudal organization, and it is suddenly, mm, over a couple of hundred years, it is replaced by a different capitalist set of social relations that stress wage labor, uh, independence of businesses. Uh, and this is followed by, ta-da, the birth of industrial society sometime in the 18th century. The problem with this theory was always that once you make the transition from feudalism to capitalism, it seems to take a long time to get from early capitalism to industrial society. So what's, what's happening during that period when feudalism ends more or less in the 14th century, industrial capitalism doesn't arrive till the 18th century, can you just say, well, it's proto-capitalism and merchant capitalism till then uh, or not? But these two different approaches have been kind of competing over time. The sudden change from a pre-capitalist to a capitalist system versus the gradual accumulation of knowledge, skills, and technology leading to takeoff. But either way, they argue that nothing quite like this happened in Asia, and things were different in the West. Um, as I say, 14th century or 18th century is the problem. Now, over time, obviously historians have been accumulating evidence on what was the pattern of economic change in Asia versus the West. Um, what we have actually found is that urbanization, which was often seen as a characteristic of Western accumulation, technology, and so on, we found that urbanization actually proceeded faster and to a higher level in Asia than in the West. Uh, Istanbul, Nanjing, Edo, and Agra were larger than London and Paris. Now, for many of you that know world history, I see many of you come from Asia or have studied in Asia, this may not be a surprise. But to Western scholars, there was a, a remarkable resistance to this. The first paper I tried to publish, in which I argued for comparative studies in society and history, that London actually was a smaller city than Istanbul uh, at the height of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, was rejected because I had my facts wrong that it couldn't possibly be. London was the biggest city in the world, and everybody knew it. So I actually had to submit to the editor um, pages copied from books and encyclopedias and citations to demonstrate that scholarship on the Ottoman Empire really did believe that Istanbul exceeded 600,000 inhabitants 
at a time when London was still about 400,000. Uh, but there was a lot of resistance to this. Um, <clears throat> I, I mentioned at the bottom here on false measures. Um, in Neil Ferguson's Civilization, he says, you know, one aspect that he looks at to show that uh, Europe was more advanced economically than Japan uh, in the 18th century is he points out that the height of uh, convicts and military recruits, kind of dregs of society, that the height of those people in England was a good five inches taller than the average height of the Japanese. So see how much better off the English were. He neglects the fact that at the same time, Edo was a far larger city than London, had a, a more vigorous uh, banking community. Um, my response to his argument on height is that the Watusi were also several inches taller than the average Englishman. They are to this day. But that doesn't mean the Watusi have a more advanced material civilization or technology. It's just a difference in diet and genetics. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Japanese diet, which was based entirely on uh, rice and vegetables and relatively little meat, did not provide as much fuel for growth as the English mutton uh, potato diet. Uh, but it didn't have anything to do with the broader changes in civilization. But people have made these assumptions. For example, the assumptions are that in Europe, property was more secure because we had tied the hands of the state. And that allowed uh, merchants to accumulate wealth. Well, in fact, looking at the inventories now of private merchants in places like Surat, uh, we find that the merchants actually did have very large private fortunes. Chinese merchants used to carry around uh, literally thousands of pounds worth of silver with them when they were taking an inner city journey to conduct wholesale trade. We now know that life expectancy, calorie consumption was roughly equal as late as the 18th century in the leading parts of Japan, China, and India. Even population growth was pretty similar. So it gets harder and harder to say, yes, you can point to the glories of Greece. You can say the Renaissance was marvelous. And yes, the stone churches that were built in the Gothic era have survived beyond many of the wooden structures that were more typical in Asia. But those are not concrete data showing the superiority of Western civilization. As I say, if we look now at the evidence of size of cities, nutrition, growth rates, what we see is similarity rather than difference. This is a map of the major trade routes in Asia uh, in the 17th century. And it, it just shows the degree to which Asia was not just, as is sometimes said, a few large empires that sat on the top of large numbers of impoverished peasants without much commercial activity. Asia had a much larger framework of commercial activity than Europe. In fact, Indian cottons were sold throughout the world. So were Chinese ceramics. Uh, there's no question that if we look and say which countries had the largest international trade networks in the production of consumer manufactured goods, in the 17th century, it was Asian societies, not European ones. Uh, I put this graph up here just to show you that um, Got this. This is a graph of real wages uh, in England. And all the way, this is 1350, 1360, um, all the way back from this period up to 1810. So this is about 500 years in which the real earnings of English workers um, show no change. Now, this stagnation seems to go against any idea that there was a gradual accumulation of advantage in Europe, England, after all, being one of the more advanced countries in Europe. We don't see any evidence that the age of exploration or the Renaissance or the period of Queen Elizabeth or the 1688 turning point when the Bank of England started providing credit. Um, you don't see any of that. What you see is up and down, up and down. You finally get this remarkable takeoff but it's only after 1830 that you get out of this range. Now, then you get out of it very quickly. So something dramatic clearly happened in the 19th century, but not before. We see the same thing if we look at other cities in Europe as well. Now, this is London. And yes, London has an advantage. But again, all of the European countries for a very long time, this is 1500 to 1850, we see little or no change in real incomes. 
Now, England had a bit of an advantage. Yes, it was a richer country. Uh, same thing was true Amsterdam, the Netherlands, um, and Antwerp in Belgium. All, all of these, this is, again, these are city, not national figures. But for the leading international trading cities, um, you see higher income per capita than you do for the more landlocked uh, capitals, Madrid, Vienna, and Paris. Leipzig starts out low, starts to catch up fairly quickly here. Paris also catches up fairly quickly. So what we're seeing in European cities, again, a confirmation of the same pattern, very little change in real wages for hundreds of years, and then all of a sudden, in the 19th century, there's a big change. How do we explain that? Um, I want to argue that in order for a change to occur after so many hundreds of years, something dramatic had to change the context. There had to be some breakout. Uh, I would argue that there was a barrier, a kind of uh, a heavy constraint on change. And to me, the constraint was, how did people acquire knowledge? How did people think about, how do we know anything about the world? Do we accept the evidence of our senses? Do we try and reason it out? There are several bases that people have used to try and understand the world. The first is actually tradition. What we get handed down to us as, oh yes, people have always known and believed this to be true. Sun rises in the, in the east, sets in the west, right? You drop something, it falls. Um, fire burns. These seem like such fundamental uh, forever truths. How can you doubt them? Uh, there's another form of tradition, though, and that is in great classic works that acquire authority over time. In the West, the works of Aristotle uh, became um, almost biblical in terms of the respect given for the great ancient master. In China, it was the works of the Confucian tradition. Uh, in <coughs> India and South Asia, uh, it was the uh, Sanskrit great works and uh, the works of Buddhism. Uh, and these kind of, the great traditions of the Axial Age uh, defined these civilizations, the very identity of Europe, China, India was wrapped up with their tradition. And so they very strongly uh, cultivated and preserved the traditional basis of knowledge. Uh, religion or revelation, things that were actually specified in sacred works that were assumed to be not just observations of the real world, but in a sense, divine revelation, the word of God revealed to man. So that which was written in the Quran, that which was written in the Bible, that which was written in the Vedas, had a certain privileged status. It wasn't just traditional knowledge that was handed down. Oh yes, we've always done it this way. These are the farming techniques we've used. Uh, these are the animals we've raised. This is what we know how to do. This is privileged. This is uh, holy information. Uh, beyond that, there was, of course, reason, knowledge that was obtained from logical demonstration arithmetic, geometry, or by deductive reasoning. The problem with logic is that you could reason anywhere depending on your assumptions, right? It didn't have a, a, a rigid base. So you had to start from something that you knew to be true. And so people usually only trusted reason if it was rooted. You had to start from something either in revelation or some well-established fact. So Aristotle could reason from the fact that objects, when you drop them, always fell. He could argue from that that there was a basic tendency of objects to always seek the center of the universe, for all earthly objects would do that. On the other hand, heavenly objects, which never fell out of the sky, must have, by logic, a different nature, a different impetus. It's their nature to move in circular orbits, and that's why they never fall. So you could build a logical edifice, but you had to start with something well established. Otherwise, you could be a trickster, and lawyers had a bad reputation uh, even thousands of years ago as people who could argue you into a corner. The sophists in ancient Greece, remember, were uh, often attacked for saying, you know, as a sophist, you can argue either side of any position. You can use your reason to attain any end. You're not really working for truth or virtue. Truth and virtue, it was argued, rely not just on reason, but on understanding the fundamental truths of nature. Finally, daily experience. There's a lot of knowledge that you get 
just by your own personal experience that's repeated. Uh, techniques that seem to work. How do woodworkers uh, manage, or woodworkers, sculptors, uh, people who uh, create bronze or uh, iron out of ore. That kind of stock of daily techniques was also very useful, and that could change incrementally over time as people um, acquired more experience. Now, tradition and religion did not change very often. You could have a heter heterodox breakthrough with religion. You could have people challenge tradition. Uh, but for the most part, tradition and religion were backed up by a strong institutional framework where kings and priests had a very strong vested interest in protecting tradition and the authority of religion. Um, reason, that could be useful, but people were always on guard against slick arguments. And then daily experience changed over time. Now, the reason I think it's imp important to differentiate those different bases of knowledge is when you put them in the context of history, I, I see a pattern. Here's what I see. The normal cycles of history go something like this. During an upswing, that is, during a period of economic and demographic growth, it might be because of new lands being acquired or favorable weather conditions or a, a decline in background disease levels. We see all of these things occur in history. Um, during an upswing, you also see people innovating, adopting new crops, uh, trying uh, uh, new techniques. Uh, you see the growth uh, of the economy fueling heterodox ideas. That is, as people start to acquire a bit of wealth, they, literacy spreads. Uh, you see, whether it's in China or in India or Europe, you see periods in which people uh, challenge the existing authorities and try and offer uh, new ideas, often individualist thinking against corporate thinking, uh, sometimes different religions. Uh, but sooner or later, given that these societies, pre-industrial societies, would bump up against a Malthusian limit, that is, the climate would change or the population would grow to the point where food supplies were strained. There would be some type of crisis, often associated with wars, disease. What happens during the crisis? During the crisis, people look for meaning. They look for security. And the typical pattern that we see in history is a retrenchment of orthodoxy. And we find a reliance mainly on tradition and religion as the ultimate certainties. In fact, you see this over and over where during a crisis, elites will say, the reason we're having a crisis is our rulers have strayed from the proper religion, or they have abandoned the traditions of our ancestors. They've done something new, it's gotten us in trouble, and we have to retrench and go back and purify. Now, um, obviously that takes you backward. But throughout most of history, remember, Throughout most of history, great religions have placed their utopia in the past. They speak of a golden age in the past from which mankind has fallen. And so the tendency during a crisis is not to look forward, to look backward. It would be desirable to make a breakthrough into something new and better. But that doesn't happen very often because to really to make a breakthrough and dismiss orthodoxy requires a great deal of abandoning knowledge that has been used and tested and relied on for a long time. Um, however, you know, a lot depends on whether that knowledge fails. A society that's actually more resilient, that is, the existing tradition and orthodoxy can accommodate change, it can be refashioned in a crisis, is liable to survive with its traditions intact. On the other hand, if the traditions and religious beliefs can be shown to be false, can be readily shown to be mistaken, uh, they're weaker, and then you're more likely to have a breakthrough where you dismiss them. And here's where my argument differs, I think, from everyone else who's written about the rise of the West. Most people, one way or another, they stress the superiority of the West as leading to its later breakthrough and emergence. Either Western institutions were better, or Western science was better, or Western curiosity was greater, but there was something that was good in the West that was better and lacking outside it. And I'm actually turning all this around and saying, no, the West actually was in many ways weaker and more vulnerable because its classical belief system was less flexible and resilient than that of other great civilizations. So I argue that the Western Christian classical synthesis was very brittle. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, 
If you look at the universities and the curriculum of higher education in Europe, what's really stunning, if you believe in change and dynamism and progress and originality, is that the basic texts used in 16th century universities were the works written roughly 1,500 years earlier. That is, what was still being studied and discussed as the basis for knowledge in uh, medieval and Renaissance universities were the works of Aristotle, later Plato in the Renaissance when they were rediscovered, but geography was based on Ptolemy. Medicine was based on Galen. Uh, botany was based on uh, Dioscorides. Uh, there was a, a little bit of exposure later to some of the atomist theorists, Lucretius, but that came actually rather later. All the way up through the Renaissance, up to the 16th century, it was the great works that were being recovered from the past that were seen as the repositories of knowledge. And it was, they were revered for their tradition. Now, there was a problem, of course, and that was these great classical authors wrote before the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was the dominant culture in Europe since, really, since um, the conversion of Constantine and the uh, conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity. So these traditions had to be reconciled. And it was the work of medieval schoolmen, particularly uh, Thomas Aquinas and his Summa Theologica, to try and reconcile these two distinct traditions, the classical Greek and Roman authors and the revelation of the Christian Bible. And they did a very good job doing that. They actually made room for the principles uh, of, of nature as revealed in the Bible and Aristotle's cosmology and Ptolemy's geography. And they basically reconciled and assembled this and said, here is the basis of knowledge. And this is what we need to copy and build on, right? The Renaissance uh, recognized the importance of meter and poetry and perspective and painting. And they attributed all that to classical models. And that's what they were trying to do is catch up to and reproduce the classical uh, work as the highest achievement of mankind. But once you've put all those things together and set them up in a certain system, uh, it proved to be fairly brittle because it was uh, not able to absorb a lot of new knowledge. The age of exploration produced a vast amount of knowledge that simply didn't fit. Now, when Europe was self-contained, they were fine with the knowledge of the ancients and the revelation of the Bible. But as soon as Europeans got to the New World, this was something that was not in the geography of Strabo and Ptolemy. First they thought it was Atlantis, which was the mythical. Then they said, well, then they thought it was India. But when they realized this was an entirely new world with new plants, new animals, new people, uh, it took a while to recognize. It wasn't instant. I mean, we're talking about from the time Columbus got there till about the middle of the 16th century before Europeans really were certain that they had discovered a totally new world with unknown cultures. But once they realized that, it was a real blow to the accuracy and knowledge of the geography that they'd been relying on. Um, similarly, when European explorers got direct contact with India and China, they were exposed, again, new plants, new animals that were unknown in the classical uh, zoology and botany. Uh, and they were exposed to other traditions. Uh, and they were exposed to information about nature, uh, information about things like the tides and navigation uh, that all of a sudden seemed like, you know, this is, a you know, this is a problem for us to understand why there are so many natural phenomena, so many species, so many plants that we had no idea were out there. Uh, and this led to an age of skepticism. People started learning more about the civilizations of Persia and India and China by direct contact, which had been very rare before. And so you had the age of skepticism. Uh, you had uh, in Italy and then spreading through Europe, the Renaissance, uh, trying to build not only a better appreciation of the past, but also learning more about the world, more accuracy in painting, uh, more understanding, building uh, cabinets of curiosities, exchanging information, and so on. Now, all of this was going on at the time when there was also an outburst of heterodox thought, the Reformation challenging the authority of the Pope and the Catholic Church, and eventually leading to massive religious wars all across Europe. 
Now, the 17th century was a period of global crisis. My book, Revolution and Rebellion in the Early Modern World, stresses that 17th century, yes, there were wars of religion and revolutions all across Europe, but there were also uprisings in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there was a big dynastic change in China with the Ming Dynasty falling, being overthrown by peasant rebellions, and then the invasion of the Manchus. Uh, the, the Mughal uh, Empire in India starts to weaken and slide toward its eventual dismemberment by the British. So there's a lot of crises going on. Why? Well, there's a, a big change in global climate, for one. Um, uh, Jeffrey Parker has a new book coming out on climate and the crisis where he demonstrates pretty conclusively that there was a problem. And we see it in the population figures as well. They clearly peak in the early uh, 17th century and start to fall. So there's a big problem going on. What happens? What is the response to this crisis? Well, in almost all of the major civilizations, and even in most parts of Europe, um, you see retrenchment. So that in China, the Manchus come in and they decide the way to uh, support their authority is by really becoming committed to sponsoring classical Confucian scholarship. And they start a big uh, process of scholarship to purify the Confucian canon, recover the real text, but that's mainly to win the support of Confucian scholars and establish their bona fides as good Confucian rulers. Uh, you see in the Mughal Empire, uh, the Mughal rulers who in the early times had been much more pluralist and had tried to mix the uh, Hellenistic Greek heritage and the uh, Hindu local heritage and the Islamic, uh, all of a sudden uh, by the time they get to the later Mughals, they get very reactionary and orthodox on Sunni Muslim faith. Same thing happens in the Ottoman Empire where scholars argue that it was the uh, falling away from the traditional social order of the Ottoman Empire that led to the problems of the 17th century. And they argue that we need to reinforce uh, both the social order and the philosophical order of the West. You even see a kind of closure so that even though the Ottoman Empire starts adopting military and banking innovations from the West, it becomes that much more stubborn about preserving religious law and religious faith and says, yes, we're, go we're going to accept particular practical innovations from the West, but we sure don't want them to undermine our basic faith, our basic way of life. And so they start treating innovations in philosophy and thought as dangerous, and their technology essentially becomes more dependent on borrowing from the West and they lose much of their indigenous uh, earlier advantages in natural science and astronomy and mathematics. After all, the Muslim world led uh, the rest of the world in those areas up until about the 14th or 15th centuries. But they start to lose it through this retrenchment. Now, we see the exact same thing in the West in places like Poland and Italy. Uh, Poland, many of us forget, was a very liberal place. It had uh, an elected parliament. It had pluralism of religion. Uh, it was one of the most wide open and dynamic areas of Europe until the Jesuits got in there uh, and basically went on a campaign to get rid of Protestantism, get rid of pluralism. They did the same thing in Spain and Italy. They tried to do it in France. They were turned back. Um, and it was kind of a near thing. I mean, for a while, it looked like France would take over uh, the Netherlands. And there was a Catholic king on the throne in England in the 17th century. And Catholicism was very much trying to suppress a lot of the Reformation religion, but also the challenges to revelation that was coming out of uh, new philosophies. Uh, so it might have been the case if Catholicism had triumphed, if the counter-revolution had been able to survive all across Europe the way it did in Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, we might not have gotten uh, anything like the Protestant ethic to survive or anything like uh, the Protestant sciences that emerged in the Netherlands and, and Britain. But as it happened, um, the victory of William III strengthened the Protestant British, Protestant Dutch alliance. They were able to stand up to the French invasions uh, and they were able to create uh, two major global trading powers that were resolutely Protestant and were looking for a different system uh, of belief than prevailed in the Catholic states. Now, it turned out that in the Netherlands, 
the Dutch Reformed Church, once it managed to establish itself and rise to the where it was strong enough to drive out all the other faiths, became fairly intolerant itself. And indeed, uh, free thinkers like Spinoza and Descartes uh, were not able to peacefully do their work. We think of Amsterdam and the Netherlands as a very open, pluralistic place. And indeed, it was when it was fighting for survival against Spain and trying to um, open itself to as many supporters as it could. But Protestantism in the Netherlands did become more rigid. Uh, during its big period of economic growth in the Golden Age, uh, it was very innovative, uh, restructured the landscape, uh, became a huge producer, manufacturer of new styles of boats, and bet heavily on windmills as the source of power. And they had the most sophisticated windmills, and they used them for everything from sawing wood to grinding grain. Uh, so it was terrific, but it was, turned out to be a dead end because windmills were not portable. They couldn't be greatly increased in their efficiency. Um, we'd, nobody knew at the time you could eventually use them to generate electricity. They couldn't make that conceptual leap, of course. Uh, they were mechanical, right? But as a mechanical source of energy, windmills had inherent limits. You had to keep making the veins bigger to get more energy, and they would eventually collapse. So it was a good technology, better than what anyone else had the time, but they couldn't compete with steam engines. Uh, but their capital was all tied up uh, in these ways. Now, I say that chance in the 17th century led to a breakthrough. Of course, not everything is chance. The um, likelihood of some differentiation in Europe between Protestant and Catholic countries was reasonable given the uh, fracturing of Europe into different national states at a fairly early point. Um, what was perhaps a fortunate chance is that those national states um, moved in such a constellation that the uh, victory of William III created a zone, as it were, in the Netherlands and England of alliance that was resolved to say, um, we're going to develop our own view of the universe and virtue. And they were willing to bet big on Isaac Newton and his view of the solar system as an alternative concept. And even though Newton was uh, lionized and his vision of gravity and a gravitational universe uh, was deeply esteemed, it was rejected on most of the continent. Uh, we don't realize this now for the most part because it seems so self-evident and logical to us. Oh, gravity, of course, right? You drop something, why does it fall? We all learn that it's gravity. But at the time, the idea that there was some invisible, universal, inherent force of attraction that could be propagated across vast distances without any medium, that is, without needing air or water to carry the uh, attractive waves. Um, it seemed kind of crazy to a lot of physicists. Even Christian Huygens, the leading physicist in the Netherlands, never quite believed in gravity as an inherent force. Descartes' idea that what was really going on is there was an ether that we couldn't see, and there were vortices in the ether, and that's what was causing the planets to go around the sun, and that's what was keeping uh, things in order. That made a lot more sense to people. They could relate to that in terms of what they saw in day-to-day -day life. And so throughout the continent, you had a triumph of a Cartesian approach. Uh, so I say it's kind of could just be chance that Newton was able to get his advantage. But what we do see in general in the 17th century in Europe that we don't see in any other major civilization is this complete rejection of the classical basis of knowledge. Both Descartes in France and Francis Bacon in England say, Aristotle, he was wrong. We have revered him and relied on him for almost 2,000 years, but you know what? He was completely mistaken in his basic principles describing nature. You see nothing like that rejection of Confucianism elsewhere. And, and you know, why should they? Because Confucianism was a very flexible view of the universe in the view of the Chinese scientists who had been mapping the solar system and had seen things like uh, supernovae and who had been exploring for years, um, it was no big deal if there was another land mass beyond Europe. I mean, they knew that from China, you could sail to India, you could sail to Africa. They had done that. They had seen Europeans come. So, all right, so there's another small, primitive, poor area further out, no big deal. Same thing, if there's a supernova in the sky, no big deal, we've seen those before. 
because in fact the essence of Chinese physics and cosmology was continuous change. The uh, I Ching and the yin and yang, the five elements, was all about how things come together and change, different movements always constantly giving back and forth. It was a very dynamic view of nature that had a lot of room for new things to appear and changes to occur without disturbing the fundamental elements. On the other hand, the Western view was very rigid. There was a certain structure of the planet. The heavens were distinct from the Earth. Planets had to move in circles, um, and they couldn't change. So when they saw supernovae for the first time, really recorded in Europe, uh, that was a shattering thing. The New World was a shattering thing. Uh, Galileo's telescopic observations just couldn't be accommodated to the classical view at all. So people like Descartes, Bacon, uh, Hobbes, they said, we have to abandon this traditional view that we've inherited from the past and start thinking ourselves. Now, Descartes you know, started with the, I think, therefore I am. Why did he say that? Because that was the one thing of which he could be absolutely certain. If he rejected everything he knew from divine revelation or traditional knowledge, he could say, at least I think, therefore I know I exist. Um, the other approach was uh, the Baconian approach, and that is to say, forget what's in tradition, forget what's in revelation, you can't trust that. What we can trust is the accumulation of inductive knowledge through careful observation and experiment. Now, the idea of experiment, I don't want to go into. It, it comes from, actually, Islamic science had a hard time percolating up through Europe, but was really embraced in a big way in the 17th century. And it led to a lot of new discoveries. And what's really stunning is in the 17th century, you see a whole raft of publications that start to scream, we have something new. We have new knowledge that's different from what the ancients had, that the ancients didn't know about that. They didn't know about magnetism. The, new, the Novum Organon, a new method. We have a new way of gathering knowledge through careful experiment. Uh, we have a new astronomy that's different from Ptolemy's system altogether. This was Kepler's uh, model of ellipses. Uh, Bacon, his new Atlantis was, we have a whole new structure in the Royal Society for uh, collective gathering of new knowledge. Uh, Francis, uh, I'm sorry, William Harvey refuted Galen on the circulation of the blood. Um, Galileo, new sciences. We have a new understanding of motion. Uh, and then Boyle, his new experiments on the spring of the air, proving that not only were there vacuums, something that Aristotle claimed was impossible, but vacuums had effects that could be measured. They had effects on fire. They had effects on living organism. You could use a vacuum to actually do work. All of these were stunning new discoveries, and they came in a big rush, but only when the authority of the classical and religious tradition had been challenged and overturned. So my argument on this element, and again, there's a lot more to the story, but I just want to say that it was a discontinuity in the basis for knowledge that changed the rate of knowledge accumulation in the West. Once you had freed yourself of the idea that everything important and true and worth knowing could be found in the classical ancient authors or the Bible, once you freed yourself of that and said, no, we can actually find important new knowledge ourselves just by doing careful empirical observation, a whole new world opens up to you and you start to obtain fresh results. If you're in China or India, you can observe the same things, but you're going to fit them into the classical framework. You're not going to treat them as the basis for new knowledge. You're going to treat them as just another observation or manifestation that fits into the old. And indeed, you try hard to do that because you don't want to upset the basis of your society if you can help it. It was really only because Western society was shattered by the combination of the Thirty Years' War and the new inpouring of knowledge about the world that they could not go back to the old ways, even though the Jesuits tried very hard and had partial success. But they couldn't force all of Europe back. And the British work with air pumps then led to the practical result of steam engines. Now, you know, people have said, oh, other societies were very close to establishing steam engines. It's not true. And the reason I say that is other societies experimented with pumps and bellows 
and so on. But the principle of a steam engine, in order to build a working practical steam engine, you have to first create a vacuum into which the steam can move to do work. If you don't have a, you can try and heat steam up. And if you heat steam up, it expands. And you can use the expansion of steam to do work. Yeah, the ancients had toys that were run on steam. Uh, some civilizations supposedly used uh, steam nozzles to open and close doors and create cute effects. But you could not run a piston engine and have a regular cycle of work just by heating up steam. You can only do that if you're heating up the steam and letting it move into an evacuated chamber, which you wouldn't create if you didn't think a vacuum was possible. And it requires a whole different set of engineering uh, ideas and techniques that Robert Boyle pioneered through literally decades of work on air pumps and vacuums that was then refined uh, by his students and eventually picked up uh, by practical craftsmen to make vacuum pumps and then steam engines. Britain also did a lot of work with clocks. And that was fortunate because the gears in clocks turned out to be essential to transmitting the power of water wheels and steam engines to machinery. And yes, water wheels did a lot. But if you look at what happened with coal, and you say, how is it that the British became so good at using coal for everything? Coal was useless unless you had a way to transfer the heat engine into mechanical energy. And for that, you needed steam engines and gears and only Britain was capable of doing all of that. And when I say the rest is history, um, I'll go back, if I can, let's see if I can go back here. No, there we go. This is what happens once steam engines became widely used. Um, this rapid exponential growth that has continued largely to this day and is the result of the systematic exploitation of experiment, the accumulation of scientific knowledge, and the deployment of that knowledge to improve production. Now, I, I will, of course, say that it is true that any civilization can learn to do this. There's nothing special about Western civilization. It's not more virtuous, more curious, more thrifty, none of the above. I simply say that Western civilization was forced because of the very weakness and brittleness of its classical inheritance to reject it when faced with an accumulation of new knowledge that didn't fit. And once it rejected that heavy weight of the past, it could embark on a new process of scientific advance. We see the same thing having happened in China after the Opium Wars, in Japan after the Meiji Restoration, in India after colonialization. Once societies are freed from the weight of tradition and are able to open up to invest in science, medicine, technology, um, they're capable of very rapid growth. Now, we can still screw it up. Uh, if you have a socialist or communist regime, it can throttle entrepreneurial capacity. So countries that opted for that route faced limits on what they could do in terms of economic growth. We can also mess it up if you, for example, if you have an educational system that puts a much higher stress on teaching philosophy and religion or on preparing people to be lawyers and accountants than to be scientists and engineers. Now, Latin America, for example, adopted a university system that put a lot of emphasis on training people for the classic professions, teaching them to be lawyers, doctors, professors, didn't develop as much emphasis on what we now call the STEM fields. The same thing in much of the Islamic world so that even today in uh, North Africa, in the Middle East, very little Western scientific work is actually translated into Arabic. The universities have a much larger theology component than they do science. Now, there's still excellent engineers that are turned out all over the world. But when you say which societies have really emphasized the competitive, innovative training of scientists and network them with engineers and entrepreneurs, it's Europe, US, Japan, Korea, and those are the areas that have led in economic growth. But I do think there's no reason this can't spread anywhere. So I have a positive message in the end. So to sum up, whereas most people have argued that the rise of the West manifested some element, whether permanent or transitory, but some element of superiority, I would argue that no. It was, in a sense, the lesser flexibility and resilience of the Western classical tradition 
that led that tradition to break and lose its hold over people's minds earlier than any of the other major civilizations did in their areas. But once liberated from the authority of classical and biblical figures, then you could usher in a whole new world of rapid invention, experiment, and innovation. And that, I believe, is what gave us uh, the modern world we have today for good and for ill. Thank you. get the discussion going. Uh, you mentioned first a uh, question. You, you indicated that, that this information and knowledge was exposed to in people in India um, with the colonialism. At, and then you mentioned China. What, what's the date for that? Uh, when, when is the exposure you're, you're saying occurs? It's an interesting comparison. Um, think about China and Japan. For a long time, Westerners looked at Japan and said, Japan is more like us. The samurai ethic, Robert Bella wrote, is a bit like the Protestant ethic. And the evidence that Japan is more like us and more flexible and more adaptive was because the Japanese economy, come World War II, was more advanced. Yeah, but that right? starts with no, the 1860s. No, let me finish. China and Japan were both exposed to Western uh, imperialism, essentially, in the mid-19th century. A little earlier in China with the Opium Wars, a little later with Commodore Perry in Japan. But look what happened next. In Japan, within a very short period, a few dozen years after Perry comes, the shogunate is overthrown. Why? Because southern um, daimyo leaders argue that you know, this shogun was not effective in standing up to the West. So we have to get rid of that system and adopt Western technology and ideas and move forward. Now, China had the same problem. The Taiping rebels had the same grievances as the southern daimyo in Japan. The Taiping said, you know, the system is bad, it's old, the Confucian way has failed, we have to take a little bit of Christianity, we have to take a little bit of uh, indigenous uh, Han Chinese virtue and get rid of these Manchus, their time has passed. But the Taiping were defeated, in part with support from Western countries. Right. And because of the defeat of the Taiping, the Chinese Confucian Empire lasted an extra 50 years. Okay. So China kind of fell behind. I, 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 now, I completely right. agree with you. So, okay. so once you get to the, once you get to the uh, Chinese Republic, and the May 4th movement and the gradual adoption of Western, pro-Western ideas, China starts to industrialize, have factories, and moves forward. All of this, of course, is wrecked by the Japanese invasion and Mao's communism, which set China back again. But today, we just see how dynamic China can be once the private sector is allowed to knit itself together and flourish. I don't think anybody today would say, oh, you see, Japan is a much more dynamic and economically progressive society than China, right? The growth rates have completely reversed. All right, the complete, uh, complete agreement on, on the contrast between Japan and, and China, the necessity of adopting a lot of this yeah. uh, scientific and experimental approach. Um, but India, was exposed, but per capita income in India in 1947 is hardly higher than it was in 1780. Correct. Um, and so there is no progress there. Why? Be I would argue colonialism essentially uh, led them down uh, administrative, and they didn't train scientists, They it produced not no real economic progress in India, right. and similarly in Africa, the the way the institutions worked in Africa, uh, similarly it resulted in exploitation of land and 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 turning uh, the, the people into uh, uh, laborers for the rich Westerners, and the same process is occurring in Latin America where the Creole elites are essentially exploiting the 
black immigrants from Africa and the indigenous population. Yeah. Let, let me just answer briefly because I know we have other questions. Yeah, let's open it up to further questions. Yeah, uh, it, very briefly, I agree with you that colonialism suppressed indigenous development, mm -hmm. but what's striking about India is how quickly they went from 3% growth to 6% growth per year once they uh, diminished the hold of socialist state planning and how, how well Brazil and Mexico have done similarly. So I think yeah. the capacity is there everywhere. Uh, Jack Richard Swedberg has a question. Yeah, I thought it was a wonderful talk. I mean, you really gave this encyclopedic overview of the rise of the West. When you started with your, less, your list of the A's, the accumulation, access, etc., cetera, uh, I was waiting for when you were going to bring in technology, because it's after all the Tada is the industrial revolution, the industry in technology, and you bring it in totally at the end, and at the end it is like it's really science that is driving the technology. You have the watch with the cogwheels and the air pump, it's a steam engine. So, I mean, it seems like people like someone like Werner Sombach would have claimed that there were earlier in uh, technological advances due to, let's say, the luxury industries, the military demanding a lot of technology. So, can you talk a little bit more about that it really is science that is leading technology and that they are not really two rather independent streams yeah. in Western? Well, that's a very good question. A lot of people have argued that Western technological growth prior to the 19th century was the work of craftsmen and tinkerers and was not really dependent on scientific advances. The people argue that, oh, Carnot didn't explain the steam engine until 100 years after they'd already been used. I don't think that's correct. I'll tell you why. We have very high levels of skill and craftsmanship across the world. And even the early phases of uh, mechanical development in England, I think it, it's true that you can build something like the spinning jenny and the Arkwright water frame without scientific uh, theory behind them. However, those advances simply helped the cotton industry in England catch up to what was already a very advanced cotton industry in China and India. Now, India uh, didn't have the sophisticated water frames, but the cost of labor was very low, and they were very sophisticated in the variety of different cotton textiles they produced. So much so that even the early Arkwright uh, machines could not produce cotton of fineness that was competitive with India. So they would import Indian cotton for uh, certain fabrics and for combination with uh, machine-produced work. What happened in England that really uh, transformed the industry was two things. First, uh, the combination of steam power with the machinery uh, greatly increased the uh, smoothness and regularity so that when James Watt uh, made steam engines work in a smooth, uh, as a smooth source of rotary power, uh, they were able to greatly increase the output uh, of these machines that had previously been dependent on water power. Uh, second thing, coal as a source of energy was dependent on sophisticated pumping to clear the mines. So you couldn't have had this huge expansion of the cotton industry if you were simply reliant on water power. There wasn't enough of it. The factories that eventually started spewing smoke in Manchester and Birmingham and Sheffield were fueled by coal. The coal could not have been mined without steam pumps. And so again, you find, yes, you could have had a certain degree of craft technology and innovation, but you wouldn't have had this breakthrough to kind of unbounded energy and unbounded accelerating growth without the breakthrough of the steam engine. And the steam engine, you can trace very directly from the work of Robert Boyle, through the work of uh, Robert Pepin, uh, and through Newcomb and Watt, and Watt being inspired by his work with scientific instruments and chemists, and figuring out that the, the key thing for the steam engine was to increase its efficiency. Now, there was no way you could measure the efficiency of a steam engine unless you could measure heat and work. And that came directly out of the scientific work of Newton and others like him. So I, I think you needed both the science and the technical skills to really create that 19th century, early 19th century breakthrough. 
We have a question there. Uh, I think you, 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 in fact, you are talking about two rises. One is the rise compared with the old, old Europe. Another rise is compared with the other countries in Asia. I'm wondering, are they the same, same, same right? And the, the reason behind this, uh, what's the same, similar reason behind this? And what's the different, different theory behind these two different two rises? Yeah. Um, on the one hand, Northern and Western Europe was able to break out sooner because they escaped the control of the Catholic Church that remained strong. But there was also a difference that I haven't talked about, and that is that the Cartesian breakthrough which was another way of departing from the old orthodoxy, was not scientifically effective. So Descartes' method of using mathematical reasoning and his physics, mechanical physics, that were based on vortices and movement, all of that was an interesting way to say, I'm going to make a new science that departs. And it turned out that his mathematics and Cartesian models were extremely useful. But because he didn't follow an experimental method, he got some of the fundamental equations of momentum and energy wrong. And this wasn't settled for a long time. In the 18th century, French scientists used Newton's equations, but they only used them in a mathematical formula to calculate certain outcomes in engineering and hydrostatics. They didn't accept the Newtonian view of the solar system. Now, that only came about when French engineers did a survey and found that the curvature of the Earth was not a sphere, which is what Descartes' theories would have predicted, but it was an oblate spheroid, which is exactly what Newton's theory predicted. And once they determined this in the early 18th century, French scientists started to think, I guess Descartes didn't have it right, that really it is Newton's vision of the natural world and his experimental approach that we need to follow. But that really didn't catch on. The French universities and schools didn't start teaching Newton until after the French Revolution, because the old church and the monarchy was so attached to the older way of doing things. Now, once the French Revolution cleared the way, the rest of Europe was able to catch up fairly quickly. But it took another 50 to 100 years for other parts of the world to make the same rejection of the past and open themselves up to the new science. We have a question from Mabel Berrison. Yeah, this isn't so much a question. It, it's a, more of a, I'm trying to sort of map your general, the sort of meta argument here. Because uh, Anyway, it was a fascinating talk, and the, the details are, are that you have a tremendous command over a lot of details. But I'm, I'm going to sort of lift us above the details a, a little bit. It's, it seemed to me that you had two points that I thought were very interesting. And one, this notion of resilience. Because I think what's counterintuitive here is I think that the intuition would be that a resilient society would be the one that could be creative. And basically what you're basically arguing is that resilience actually sends you back to the old. Uh, and resilience has a degree of flexibility in, to, in it. And that, that's, and that basically you give the example of Confucianism and things like that. So that is the lack of resilience essentially that makes for creativity. Is that it? That's the argument. So then the second point is, what makes you unable to go back to the old? And that's what, I guess that's one of my questions. I have a two-point question here. But what was the crisis in the West? That they couldn't go back to the religious doctrine? Or that they had actually gone out and traveled and explored and seen new things? And the combination of geography and experience with the fact that they couldn't go back to the religious tradition, actually was the wellspring of creativity, which then manifested itself in its historical specificity in all these different places. Okay, is is that the core of the argument? Yes. Okay, and then the, with one amendment, that okay. you can be very creative within a given classical tradition. Okay. But it's one thing to be creative within a tradition; it's another thing to kind of eliminate that tradition altogether which opens up new spheres that are different for So creativity. then would you argue that innovation is something you're always pushed to? I mean, would that be a logical conclusion? Um, that nobody innovates without crisis or rupture, I guess. I wouldn't say that nobody innovates without crisis, yeah. um, but the pace of innovation mm -hmm. is affected by the number of constraints on the innovators. Mm -hmm. So if you have a crisis, for example, um, in the 17th century, there was a huge crisis in China. The old um, Ming Dynasty collapsed. 
there were huge uprisings. Uh, the power of the old landlord class was broken. The Manchus kind of created a new administrative structure. And there were great innovations in um, agriculture that led to multiple cropping, uh, new combinations of uh, silk work uh, and rice. And from about 1600 to 1750, you have a doubling of population in China without any apparent decline in living standards. And that really is the result of innovations in everything from agriculture and administration to manufacturing and long distance trade. But it's innovation that doesn't challenge the fundamental conception of what's possible. It's incremental improvement, some of it very large scale incremental improvement, but it doesn't give you a new scientific frontier where you can invent new sources of energy. Uh, now, why does, it ha why does it just happen? You know, wh why is it so hard? Well, when you think about the breakthroughs that Galileo and Newton made, they were telling people that this Earth that we're on um, is spinning so rapidly that the sun is actually stable in the sky, but it gives the illusion of rising and setting because we're spinning like crazy. People rejected that. They said, well, we'd be thrown off the Earth. Well, then you have to believe in gravity but what is gravity? Well, you can only justify gravity if it's the solution to some overwhelmingly elegant problem that requires you to reject the whole Ptolemaic system and say, I have a beautiful, elegant model of the solar system that allows me to accurately predict the location of all the planets from a simple inverse square law as long as you let me put gravity in there as a cause. And people had to suspend their belief about the most basic things that they knew, that we're standing still on a flat, stable Earth. Uh, in order for the development of uh, simple Newtonian physics, and as I say, even Newtonian physics was rejected for a long time. The vacuum was rejected. Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels makes fun of people in the Royal Society. He says, these foolish people waste their time weighing the air. Why are they weighing bottles of different gases? What a stupid thing to do. But it's this accumulation of very counterintuitive knowledge that eventually creates faith that you know experiments do produce real knowledge. Uh, people rejected Harvey's idea that the blood circulates because it just didn't make sense. All of classical knowledge says the blood pulses back and forth. The veins and the arteries are different systems that you can't you can't have the veins and arteries connected. It didn't make sense to people. And then he showed experimentally through magnifying glasses that he could find the capillaries and demonstrate the flow. And this effort to say what we knew, what we thought we knew, was wrong. This battle of the ancients and the moderns. People had this debate. Who knows more about the world, the ancients or the moderns? The moderns eventually won, but it wasn't easy. So when I talk about creativity, you see in the art world, for example, you, you see cre continual creativity in artistic styles all the way through, Baroque, realist, and so on. Um, but you don't see a breakthrough to something like um, cubism elsewhere, because you don't get that radical break with the traditional uh, canon of what's knowledge and virtue the way you do in the West. Mm -hmm. So it's just a different direction that creativity was allowed to go. But everything else you said, I agree. Yeah. We have a question back there. Uh, yes, what do you see as the role of law, look, uh, Western law and legal culture, and I'm thinking particularly of intellectual property and patents, which are being institutionalized right during this time? Well, I have a twist for you. Mm -hmm. I don't think patents, intellectual property, or property rights were all that important, even though there's a huge weight, as you know, placed on them by many conventional people. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Well, you look at corporations. People have said, look at the East India Company, the Dutch East India Company. They pioneered shareholdings. They pioneered uh, corporate structure. But they were both failures, in my view. The East India Company eventually has to be taken over by the British government because they stopped making a profit. The same thing, the Dutch East India Company stops making money as a trading company, becomes a colonial authority in Indonesia. And once they stop making money off their monopoly because the Indonesian spices are transplanted elsewhere, they have to be taken over by the Dutch government. So I don't think they're screaming successes. And in fact, neither did the British, because after the South Sea bubble, the British actually banned corporations for over 100 years. And the typical uh, British firm became a, a partnership with someone and sons, someone brothers, right? That was the typical form. 
Um, what you get with property rights, we find that informal enforcement, Victor Nee's book on China, I think is fabulous, showing that if you can have informal mutual respect, establishing local sanctions for abuse of property, uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize, a lot of her work tells you the same thing, you don't need formal state-enforced laws to have an economy where people can use resources effectively. They will work out their own way of doing this. What I do think was very important, though, in the British legal system was the jury system. The jury system was an interesting model for determining what's fact and what's not. In most legal systems throughout the world, you have an expert, a judge, who determines what are the facts of the case, what's true, what's false. And that was a good model for Roman law and a good model for the papacy being the authority over what's true and what's not. Um, all of those top-down legal systems that say you trust an authority are very consonant with the idea that you trust revelation, written law, and authorities to make your decisions. The jury system, on the other hand, says the judge presides, but it's the jury that determines what's fact and what's falsehood. And the lawyers have to convince the jury, and the jury makes the decision. That's the model that the Royal Society adopted when Robert Boyle started saying, I want to prove to people that my experiments with vacuums are really true. What do I do? I'm going to assemble a group of my peers and do my experiments in front of them. And when they can confirm by the evidence of their eyes and they agree that this is valid, we will know that we have ascertained true knowledge, new facts. And so the practice in the Royal Society was one of public experiment, public display, public lectures, and verification essentially by a jury. And this model of how do we determine fact, not because an authority says it's a fact, but because a body of people who are seen as peers or equals agree that they have been convinced. I think that was very important for the advance of experimental science. So there I think the legal system was critical. We have time for one more question and I'll take that opportunity. Uh, oh, okay. because, <laughs> because it, I've been thinking about I'd like to push you back to that slide, economist versus sociologist. Okay. Um, and it seems to me when that you pose the difference as sociology emphasizes discontinuous change and the economists emphasize uh, incremental uh, change but with a uh, tipping point that leads to uh, essentially discontinuous right. change. Um, and as I think about your argument, it, it doesn't contradict what the economists have been arguing, that good institutions were involved in providing the incentives, uh, property rights, and so forth for the Industrial Revolution. And they were also involved in providing the framework for the intellectual scientific revolution, which then combined and uh, created this tremendous uh, uh, dynamic explosion in the West. Yeah. Uh, that, that it doesn't strike me as your argument, which is very persuasive, uh, really contradicts what we have learned from the economic historians like Joe McKeer and John Lewis North right. and well, I've, right. I've learned a lot from these people as well, yeah. and I'm not trying to overturn all of what they say. I'm simply pointing to what I think is a major aspect of incompleteness in their thought. I absolutely agree that bad institutions can destroy the progress of science, knowledge, economic growth, they can bottle up knowledge, interfere with its development. You do need good institutions in order for these processes to take place. Where I disagree with them is simply the belief that if you have the right set of institutions, everything else flows as a matter of course, because of economic incentives provide adequate basis for innovation. I think what we've actually seen in the history of innovation over the last 150 years is that even if you have good institutions, even if you have um, investment in research and development, that doesn't assure a breakthrough. Scientific progress has its own internal dynamic, which sometimes accelerates over time, sometimes slows down. You need to encourage that dynamic, but you also have to pay attention to what is happening intellectually, what is happening in science, to understand the full picture. 
Okay, we have time for one last question. Yeah. Thank you. What your thoughts are on foreign rulemaking, thinking of you know, pre-Western um, imperialism, one common fact between China and India is the Manchu rule and Mughal rule, which we you know this Mughal rule went on for 200 years. And you know, what kind of impact foreign rule may have had on scientific innovations, where the money was spent, and how it may have sort of impacted culture and innovation in a certain way? Well, I don't think it's foreign rule per se that tells you whether something good or bad will happen. You know, when the Romans conquered Greece, they absorbed Greek culture and it stimulated a creative period, the so golden age of uh, Latin poetry and scholarship. So it's more of if you have a authority, whether it's a conquering authority or an indigenous authority, that feels threatened or insecure, and they decide the best way to stabilize their political position is to enforce a very rigid orthodoxy of belief uh, because that encourages people to be obedient and not question them. That is what is fatal to innovation. And that can occur with either an indigenous or a conquering society. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.